yo, episode three, let me go, ah. Uh. God, he always was, he always is, he always will be. He's just the one who is. He is not contingent on anything. He doesn't have a beginning, he doesn't have an end. He just exists. That means that there's a creator creature distinction that again we don't have in the pagan myths of before and the pagan myth of today. Evolution is a pagan myth. Oh yeah. If for the last two episodes you listen my perspective and my diction, I offer a benediction. I still on the continuum but laying foundation bricks down with precision. This one is the Christian vision prescription. You catch the mission? Let me bless the studio. Eh? Fix up the microphone, check one, two, three, go. Yeah. This is Udo Ibeleme, your host, and welcome to the show. Preach Jesus. This is a story, I'm sure many of you heard it already, but a man who thought he was dead. He thought he was dead, and it really upset his family because this guy in his house thought he was dead. And they tried every argument they could to convince this guy that he was not dead. Nothing worked. And they thought, okay, we'll take him to a medical doctor. A medical doctor will be able to convince this man that he's not dead. So they take him to a medical doctor, and the doctor thinks for a bit and goes, hmm, do dead men bleed? And the guy thought for a minute, he said, uh, no, their hearts aren't pumping, there's no blood going through their veins. Oh, dead men don't bleed. Doctor took out a pin, stuck him in the finger. Blood starts coming out. The guy goes, oh, what do you know? Dead men do bleed. <laughs> See, and that's the problem. We'll evaluate stuff according to what we already believe. If you don't deal with their presuppositions, that's what you're going to get. And that was a clip from the film How to Answer the Fool by um, Sai Ten Bruggenkat. I'm not sure if I'm saying that properly. I hear most people say Saiten Bruggenkit, right? So let's go with that. Saiten Bruggenkit, right? It's freely available on YouTube and it's also available elsewhere. Um, and this is just about one's pre-beliefs, the base of someone's belief. If the base of your belief is that you are dead, um... And that's the bottom, bottom, bottom of your belief. If that's your presupposition, then even someone showing you that you are doing things that alive people do, all it does is that they take that and they filter it through their worldview, which says that they are dead. And so it helps them to keep to their base assumptions, their base presuppositions. And so this is what I am addressing what i consider to be my presuppositions of as a christian sorry is what i'm going to call the christian vision prescription because it rhymes right and because i wear glasses so um i'm laying a foundation for other things that we will talk about later um i also want that when um i address something um i can always refer back here to get you guys to understand the perspective from which I'm coming because it's unfortunate but I believe that we are in a time where um, thinking in a Christian way not holding a Christian creed not believing in Christ not saying that you're a Christian but thinking in a Christian way has become sort of um, is, is not the norm um, we are coming out of a time centuries ago where thinking in a Christian way was the norm for non-Christians. Now we are in a time where thinking in a secular way, in a non-Christian way, is normative for even Christians. And so um, here I am trying to help my brothers and sisters to evaluate even their presuppositions and replace them with biblical ones to think in Christian ways, right? This is... Um, where I'm running everything through perfectly sometimes and perfectly sometimes but at all times in which it is even done well it is done by God's grace I don't hold myself up as um, an infallible standard but I will say um, as Paul did follow me as I follow Christ so to the extent that I'm getting this right then um, someone can follow me to the extent that I'm inaccurate, 
and I'm not holding to these sorts of biblical presuppositions, then someone shouldn't follow me, right? So let's get into the meat of the matter and talk about some of these um, presuppositions. The first um, thing I want to talk about is how do I know that um, this um, prescription is going to make me see better or worse? How can I evaluate even myself and my ability to know what I'm talking about? How do I know what I know, right? Um, I'm going to go first of all um, to Colossians chapter 2, verses 1 through 8. For I want you to know how great a struggle I have on your behalf and for those who are at Laodicea. This is Paul speaking. And for all those who have not personally seen my face, that their hearts may be encouraged, having been knit together in love and attaining to all the wealth that comes from the full assurance of understanding, resulting in a true knowledge of God's mystery, that is Christ himself, in who are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. I say this so that no one will delude you with persuasive argument. For even though I am absent in the body, nevertheless I am with you in spirit rejoicing to see your good discipline and the stability and the stability sorry of your faith in christ therefore as you have received christ jesus the lord so walk in him having been firmly rooted and now being built up in him and established in your faith just as you were instructed and overflowing with gratitude see to it that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deception according to the tradition of men according to the elementary principles of the world rather than according to christ what i'm going to assert here at the beginning is that all knowledge comes to us from god so um, my answer to the question how do you know what you know will be the same way everyone knows what they know god has revealed it to them now hear me out here very very this is very important i am not saying that i have a special revelation from god that you don't have or that um i know that god is real because of that or whatever the case is i am saying i am saying that because of our god everyone knows everything that they know no one can know anything apart from god so um knowledge has to do with um, believing in the truth and it has to do with certainty, complete certainty, right? So um, it has to do with truth and certainty. So if I, you ask me what 2 plus 2 is and I say 5, then do I know that 2 plus 2 is 5? Can I even know that 2 plus 2 is 5? Can I know that 2 plus 2 is 5? I can't because you cannot know something that is not true. Now, if likewise um, you ask me, what is 2 plus 2? And I say that it is 4, but I can be wrong. Do I know that 2 plus 2 is 4? No. In order for me to know that 2 plus 2 is 4, it has to be true, which it is. But I also have to be certain of it, completely certain of it. That's how you get knowledge, is truth and certainty. Knowledge is certainty about the truth, right? So the fact of the matter is that none of us here, none of us, Christian, non-Christian, it doesn't matter. None of us know anything. N none of us know everything. My apologies. None of us know everything. And uh, it has happened, I'm sure many times to you as it has to me, that um, I learn something new and that contradicts something else that I was certain of. Something else that I thought I knew. But again, you cannot know something that is not the truth, right? So there was something that I thought I knew and then there's something that I don't know that contradicts it. So I don't know that. I just think I know it, right? So... If I can be wrong or if I can be uncertain about something, then I don't know it. If I don't know all things, then there's a possibility that something that I 
that I think I know can be contradicted by truth that I don't know, right? And so the only way for me to be certain about everything is to have a revelation from someone who knows everything. And this is where God comes in, right? Um, here it says in verse 3 of Colossians 2, it says that in Christ is hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. So if anyone knows anything, if anyone is certain of anything that is actually true, that corresponds with reality, it is because Christ has revealed it to them, right? And that might be confusing. How can you say that Christ has revealed it to them? Um, now, first of all, we have to know that um, God is the creator, right? God is the creator of all things. And all things were created by his word. And so there is not anything that you can look at, interact with, or that you are that isn't the product of God speaking. In such a sense, God has communicated everything into existence and there is nothing that exists that we can know, apart from God himself, of course, that is not communicated to us by God. God himself is communicated to us by him as well. But um, even things that we... Um, connect with all over us psalm chapter 19 it says the heavens are telling of the glory of god and their expanse is declaring the work of his hands day to day pours forth speech and night to night reveals knowledge there is no speech nor are there words their voice is not heard their line has gone out through all the earth and their utterances to the end of the world right so basically basically the heavens and the skies, yes, they are declaring the glory of God. And they're speaking to us. Speech is coming to us from there. Now, it's not like you could open your ear and hear the speech, but it's there and it reaches to us. Right? Psalm 33, verses 6 through 9. By the word of the Lord the heavens were made, and by the breath of his mouth all their host. He gathers the waters of the sea together as a heap. He lays up the deep in storehouses let all the earth fear the lord let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him for he spoke and it was done he commanded and it stood fast right everything is by the word of god everything is by the breath everything is by the breath of his mouth right so he spoke and it was done he commanded and it stood fast god is communicating and he communicated on the first week. He communicated on the first week. And that is how we got everything. Right? So he has revealed all of these things to us. As he has created them, he has revealed them to us. But not just that. He has revealed himself to us through all of these things. Right? Um, Romans chapter 1 from verse 18 for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness because that which is known about God is evident within them for God made it evident to them. So he has gotten this through to us, right? In order to suppress the truth and unrighteousness, as verse 18 says, you have to have the truth. So this truth has come to us and we are pretending like we don't have it and we're pushing it down under the water like a beach ball, right? And... But we know it because God has made it plain to us, right? Since the creation from verse 20 of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen being understood through what has been made so that they are without excuse. So everything and his, his eternal power, his divine nature, and the fact that he's the creator, all of these things have been manifest to us, have been manifest to us through creation, right? So that we are without excuse for denying him, those of us that would, right? Even though they knew God, we knew God. We did not honor him as God or give thanks, but we became futile in speculations. And this is how we get the pagan myth of evolution, right? Um... 
we start to speculate. Of course, this is not science. You can't really use science to determine what happened in the past unless you assume that um, you, you have to make assumptions about that to, to do, to, what's the opposite of forecast? To do that in the opposite direction, you have to assume certain things are not going to change in order to come up with that. But then um, you have to even state in your conclusion that assuming that all things being equal between now and six million years ago, this is how um, this came about. This is how the earth came about. This is how such and such came about. These are speculations, right? It's not truth. Truth is revealed to us by God. Any truth that we know, it's revealed to us by God. Professing to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God for an image in the form of corruptible man and of birds and four-footed animals and crawling creatures. So, knowledge comes to us from God. Not just that. Knowledge about God comes to us from God. And uh, to the degree that we, we reject what God has made plain to us, to the degree that we even reject God, who, as I am trying to explain here, is the ground for anyone's knowledge of anything. We don't know whatever we base on those false presuppositions. We don't know those things, right? So, for instance, people would say, you know, we know that um, this came about over millions or billions of years. No, they don't. They don't know that. That is... Uh, that is the fruit of futile speculations, of darkened, foolish hearts, of those who um, became fools even though they're professing themselves to be wise. That's what, that is the, um, that, that's the product of that. You understand? Rejecting God, becoming foolish, and positing something that is not true, and then saying that's what we know. You don't know it, right? The fear of the Lord Proverbs chapter 1 verse 7 is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. You cannot say that you know something if it's not based on the fear of the Lord, right? If we do not have our God and we do not have his word, we cannot know what we know. So for instance, um, um, as I said, we know what we know. Any of us that knows anything, that knowledge comes from God. So someone would ask, how do you know that um, you know God is real or whatever the case is? And my answer would be that they have that mixed up. Since my God is real, I can know something. Since my God is real, you can know something. Because otherwise you can't know anything. And uh, there is not any, there is not any other ground for knowledge. There is not any other um, solid ground for knowledge, other than Christ, other than Christ, in whom is hidden all the treasures and wisdom and knowledge. In whom are hidden all the treasures and of wisdom and knowledge, right? And this is why. Paul is saying this so that we would not be deluded with persuasive argument. He is saying this so that no one takes us ca captive through philosophy, through empty deception, according to the tradition of men, according to the elementary principles of the world, which would be the result of futile speculations. These are not things that we know. These are things that we posit because we reject God, right? according to the tradition of men, according to the elementary principles of the world, rather than according to Christ. We know what we know. We know anything that we know. Anyone knows anything that they know because God has revealed it to them, right? But God has that general re revelation. He also has special revelation. God has come, and uh, according to Hebrews chapter 1, Right, the first two, the first two verses in the book of Hebrews, um, long ago, in many times and in many ways, God spoke through the prophets, and in these last days, speaking then, um, he, yes, 
spoke and he's revealed himself to us through his son, heir of all things, through whom he also made the world. So back then, there were prophets, prophets that God used to communicate to man his will, what he was going to do, what he wanted us to do, what he was going to do depending on what we did, all of those things. And plainly spoke to some, gave some interpretations of dreams gave, in different ways. God did, God did what he did in different ways, including miracles, including all of those stuff. And in the last days, he came through Jesus, right? And uh, miracles and different stuff were in, involved there. And Jesus also had apostles that he commissioned to represent him in certain ways, gave them certain um, abilities and tasked them to preach, right? And they represented him. So you have all of that special, specific revelation, God coming to you and saying, thus says the Lord sort of thing. You have that in the prophets. You have that in Christ and his apostles. And, praise Jesus, we have all of that in the Bible. All right? And so, if we want to know anything for sure, because, again, you can see the truth from creation and you can suppress it. But when it's in black and white, it is very, very obvious that someone who is twisting that is twisting it, right? Because it's right there for everyone to see, for everyone to read, right? So whoever is twisting that is twisting it. So all knowledge comes to us from God. God speaks to us generally through creation, which includes us, right? So you can't even know yourself without knowing God and without getting revelation from God. And speaks to us especially through his word and uh, of course god is revealed to us and brought near to us through jesus christ as well right but all knowledge all knowledge the treasures of wisdom and knowledge come to us from christ and this i believe is an important presupposition a very very important piece of the christian vision prescription Enjoy the content here on the Udui Bellames show. There is a way in which you can offer support. Doubles. Doubles. But that's too much about me and my desire for doubles, which you can buy me by clicking the link in the show notes. Buy me a double. But do you like the sound of my voice? If you don't, then this isn't helping my case. But if you do, then here's my opportunity to blame it on something that has nothing to do with the way God made my voice box. The microphone. I am speaking into Audio-Technica's AT2020. 2020 like the year, but better. AT2020. The AT2020 works well for recording this show. It also works well for recording your very own music. And for just $99, it can all be yours. Warning, if you don't have a quiet room to record in, with no echo or reverb, this mic will not work well for you. It is a condenser mic, which is just a fancy way of saying that it's so powerful, it can hear your thoughts. I sound ridiculous. If you click the link in the show notes, Jeff Bezos, Her Majesty Queen Hippolyta, and I have worked out that when you make your purchase on Amazon, you will also be supporting the show. So, buy yourself a mic and start recording. If you don't need a mic, well, <laughs> you know what to do. Buy me a double. Praise Jesus. Praise Jesus. Jesus. 
All right. So we are back and uh, we just spoke about how we know what we know. Um, now I want to talk about God briefly, right? Um, the God that we... I keep saying God, 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 God. Um, let's talk about what God is like, right? Um, God has a name and that name is Yahweh. And uh, we have four letters of that name. Yod, He, Wow, He, right? Y-H-W-H, that's what we know. Um, the best we can assume is that that's how it was pronounced, right? Um, people have said Jehovah. That's a sort of English transliteration issue. Um, but um, yeah, this is it here, Yahweh, right? Um, and we get this from Exodus chapter 3. Um, um, God reveals himself, and we'll talk about it a little bit, right? From verse 13. Then Moses said to God, Behold, I am going to the sons of Israel, and I will say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you. Now they may say to me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, Thus you shall say to the sons of Israel, I am has sent me to you. God furthermore said to Moses, Thus you shall say to the sons of Israel, The Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and this is my memorial name to all generations. Nice. So um, God is commissioning um, Moses, who has run away from Egypt for a number of years, gotten a wife, all of those things, to go back and to um, speak to Pharaoh, tell him to let the Israelites go, and also to speak to Israel and, and let them know, you know, God is going to be faithful to their fathers and take them out, right? Now, so Moses is saying, yes, I'm going to do all of this and all of these things, but how, how would you be identified? What is your name, right? And in the Bible, a lot of times you see someone has a name and that name tells you a lot about them, right? So, um, and God, and God also, um, goes through the process of changing names in order to say something about them as well. And we see this all over a very, um, prominent version of this is, um, Jacob. Jacob means heel grabber, which is a sort of an idiom, I guess, for being a trickster being a deceive, deceiver and we see Jacob do that um, throughout his life and we see it also fall back on his head um, when he wants to marry a wife which is interesting right but that's not what we're talking about we're talking about God God's name God says I am who I am right and then he says I am has sent me to you and then he says the Lord right now if you have a KJV, INASB, something like that, that Lord will be in all caps. And that's because the word there is not um, Adonai or Lord in any sense like that. Um, like, that's not what the literal word is. The word there is what we would call Yahweh, right? And uh, in a sense, that is a third person to the I am that we have in verse 14. So it says, I am there, and Yahweh come like he is, or the one who is, right? So our God is the one who is. He's the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, the God that made a covenant with them, and uh, he is going to fulfill it here. The context of what's going to happen with the children of Israel is the fact that God is, has been in covenant with um, their fathers, and by extension with them as well, Right? But the Lord, Yahweh, he is the one who is. That is um, an awesome name because it lets you know what type of God we're dealing with. We're not dealing with a God who is as much a part of the cosmos as we are. Um, so in these different pagan myths, we have um, everything starts with primordial goo and then gods 
emerge out of it and then they take some of the goo and make it into something else and then they make human beings or human beings emerge or such and such and such and sometimes in some myths humans can become gods or gods can be demoted and all of those things there's a chain of being that goes through all of reality as far as they are concerned and uh, interestingly with um, evolution we have gone back there in the name of going forward we have gone back to where everything has come from a primordial singularity springs out into everything and everything that there is goes forward by competition you understand survival of the fittest if you survive you your genes will live on if the others don't survive then it won't and that's how we advance and we get further and we get further and then some of us would advance above others gain control of others and in a sense become the gods of the system because we don't believe that there's anything above us right but here we have the one who is no matter how much we try to be god we are not we i cannot call myself the i am i can't call myself you can't call me the one who is he is because at some point in time i was not i'm not that old at some point in time i was not and at some point in time i will not be you understand but god he always was he always is he always will be he's just the one who is he is not contingent on anything he doesn't have a beginning he doesn't have an end he doesn't um have need for anything in such a way that it can jeopardize his existence he just exists that is just who he is he is the one that exists he is the uncreated. He is a satus. He is God all by himself, as, as some people say. Right? And uh, that means that there's a creator-creature distinction that, again, we don't have in the pagan myths of before and the pagan myth of today. I'm going to keep using that language. Pagan myth. Evolution is a pagan myth. Right? It's just a modern one. But um, so we have the creator-creature distinction. God is the one who is and we are creatures. We are creatures that at some point in time we're not. This world is a creature, is a created thing that at some point in time was not. He is the creator of all things. Revelation chapter 4 verse 11 says, Worthy are you, our Lord and our God, to receive glory and honor and power for you created all things. And because of your will, they existed and were created. Right? So this God is the creator of all things. And that's just how it works. He is the creator. Right? He created all things. So there is God and then there is created things. No matter how big, how powerful, how strong it is, it is a created thing. It had a beginning and it can very well have an end according to the creator, right? But um, God is not just um, the creator, he's the sustainer and he's the determiner of all things. Um, now, people usually talk about um, God's... Um, sovereignty i'm i'm speaking about determination right because i think it's a bit more clear you talk about um a sovereign and you're talking about someone who is in charge of everything and god is in charge of everything but um i don't think it communicates it works well as a theological term for those of us who know what that means right but um for the plow boy I think um, determination, God determines all things that happen. I think that kind of gives a clearer picture because I can be a sovereign of a country, of a nation, of my house. I can have all rule and reign in my house, which I do, right? That has been given to me by God. I have all rule and reign in my house, but 
I do not determine all things that happen in my house. My wife can at some point in time do something that I don't expect or that I don't agree with. My children at some point in time can do something that I don't expect or that I don't agree with, that I don't expect that I wouldn't have wanted them to do at that point in time or whatever. And anything that happens after that, I have to get in at the tail end and work it out in a way that um, would be pleasing to me if I, if I want that to change. God, on the other hand, is the determiner of all things, right? We don't need to be God's public relations officer when it comes to the bad things that happen in the world, right? Um, we shouldn't be. We should be very, very proud of God for being the determiner of all things. And this also um, shows us our faith in God throughout anything that happens. We don't need to salvage God's image from anything that happens that it is it, so bad that we can't say that, okay, God had no hand in it at all or whatever. It was the devil. That's very, very scary as a matter of fact. That's very, very scary to think about that um, there is a whole realm of reality as we experience it that um, if God didn't want it to happen um, or if that, that God is not at the beginning of it, that God is not that God is not directing it. That's a bit scary. It means that it's pointless. It means that it's meaningless, right? Um, and it also negates certain promises that we have in the word of God, one of which I will go to, right? But um, I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's go to some texts. Isaiah chapter 45, verse 7. The one, and this is referring to God, the one forming light and creating darkness, causing well-being and creating calamity. I am the Lord, Yahweh, who does all these, right? So God forms light, creates darkness. God causes well-being, creating calamity. When God created the heavens and the earth, it was all dark. And then God created the light, right, on that first day. And he separated the light from the darkness and he had something for the light to do he had something for the darkness to do and uh, we might not see that so much as moral right but god called it good at the end of the day that both of these things exist and they exist for his glory um but also god made a moral point of light and darkness throughout the gospel of john which i'm going through with my family right um at the beginning starts off in the beginning was a word word was with god the word was god same was in the beginning with god all things were made through him and nothing that was made was made without him right and in him was life and the life is the light of men and and that light shines in the darkness and the darkness can't overcome it and then there's other stuff about light going forward in john um where there's an ethical point made about light and darkness and uh, the light has come into the world and men love the darkness rather than the light because their deeds are evil. So there's a sense in which light and darkness is a picture of moral realities, good and evil respectively, right? And so in the same way that God created the light and he has the darkness there, God has a purpose for evil as well. And that is not just me drawing an analogy from light and darkness, which I am, but the very next phrase in this same Isaiah chapter 45 verse 7 says that God causes well-being and he creates calamity, right? And that is in black and white. If you disagree with that, you're not disagreeing with me. We have the story of um, Joseph, for those of you that are familiar with that. Um, Joseph was one of Jacob's 12 sons and he was sold into slavery by his brothers with the exception of um, the last one and the first one. Um, the last one, Benjamin, he wasn't there. The first one, Reuben, he also wasn't there, right? Um, but he was sold into slavery and he went through a lot of hardships, but he ended up being second in command in Egypt and being in charge of Egypt's storehouses of food. 
um, to sell to people when there were seven years of famine that um, he was able to um, predict from uh, a dream that Pharaoh had, interpreting that dream by the power of God, right? Um, and now all his brothers have come to live with them. There was some level of reconciliation before this, but all his brothers come to live with them in Egypt and they're being taken care of. And then Jacob dies. And in chapter 50, um, his brothers are coming to beg him, basically to, to beg him not to deal harshly with them because of what they did to him. And uh, this is what Joseph says. And this is a famous verse, Genesis chapter 50, verse 20. As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good in order to bring about this present result to preserve many people alive. Now, I've heard people say that, um, you know, people mean things for evil, but God turns it around for good. This is, again, just like me. Something happens in my house that I didn't expect and that I didn't budget for and that I can't deal with if I don't go in at the tail end and try to redirect things in a favorable direction, right? If, if I don't try to redirect things and turn them in a favorable direction, then um, it won't go well for me. But no, this doesn't say that God turned it around for good after it happened. This says that God meant it for good, meaning he is an active participant. He is a first mover in this, right? And he has intention behind it. And even though the characters in the story their intentions are evil his intention in writing it into the story is good because he wants to bring out a particular result right um we even have the story of job right job is um he is dealing with a bunch of hardships that have come to him because um god has allowed satan to afflict him in various ways and uh a bunch of things have happened to his children and to his wealth. And uh, this is Job's response, right? And this is from Job chapter 1, verses 20 to, ver to, to 22. Then Job arose and tore his robe and shaved his head, and he fell to the ground and worshipped. He said, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I shall return there. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of of the Lord. Through all this, Job did not sin, nor did he blame God. All right? So what is happening here is that um these things have happened and God and and Job is saying it is Yahweh that has given these things. And now Yahweh is taking them away. And praise Yahweh. And the next verse says that he was not inaccurate in what he was saying. This is what sin means. Sin is moral but sin is also inaccuracy there's a part in the bible that talks about um um those who have a sling and a stone and they can hit a target and not sin not miss this is what sin means is 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 about inaccuracy job was not inaccurate in what he was saying so we've established job was not wrong the scripture says that god that job was not wrong for saying what he said the scripture also says that in saying that he was not blaming god so it is not um right to say that someone that is um that is asserting as i am that god determines all things is blaming god for bad things right um that would be inconsistent with this if you go forward to the end of the book in job chapter 42 right verse 11 um this is after everything has taken place um, it says here, um, then all his brothers and all his sisters and all who had known him before came to him and they ate bread with him in his house and they consoled him and comforted him for all the adversities that the Lord had brought on him. And each one gave him one piece of money and each a ring of gold. So um, basically what we have here is an acknowledgement again that God brought these things on Job. Who can argue with what is 
plainly in black and white in the scripture. Right? He's the determiner of all things. And in doing and in being the determiner of all things, he is not therefore evil or capricious or the author of sin. Job can see that God has taken away without blaming God. And what about um, the worst thing to ever happen? We think about all the things. You think about um, all of the um, things that have ever happened to anyone in this life. The worst thing to happen in the world was also the best thing to happen in the world. And that was the crucifixion of our Lord Jesus Christ, right? Who died for our sins. In Acts 4, verses 27 to 28, um, Jesus had recently left the church is growing and uh, they have been accosted by the powers that be not to speak in the name of Jesus and they are here praying for boldness but um this is what um this is what they put before that request for boldness right for truly in this city they were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the people of Israel, to do whatever your hand and your purpose predestined to occur. So, God predestined that what happened to Jesus would occur, and yet it was the most evil thing that could ever be done by man to judiciously under the law kill a righteous man that of course is also the incarnate god and also for 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 doing nothing wrong jesus did nothing wrong while he was on earth right and uh, herod pontius pilate the gentiles and the jews they are all guilty they have all done the worst thing ever and God judges them soon after. But this was also the purpose of God, the hand of God, the predestination of God, the determination of God that this would happen. And the net result of it is good, which is something that we have also in Romans chapter 8, verse 28. We know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. We can't trust this verse if God doesn't determine all things. Right? If God doesn't determine all things, then we cannot trust this verse. Right? This is a comfort for the Christian that there is nothing that happens by chance, ultimately speaking, Chance is merely theoretical. There's nothing that ultimately happens by chance. Everything is decided by the God who is on our side. And he does all of these things and they all work together for good. And the good is the greatest good. The good that we would be conformed to the image of his son Jesus. As Romans 8.29 says, if you go on to the other verses, it tells you what he does. He... he knew us and he loved us beforehand he predestined us to be conformed to the image of his son he called us he justified us and he will glorify us right that is the good that all of these things work together for and uh, because of that we get to enjoy we get to enjoy the blessings that come from being in jesus right and these are these are again this is another part of the christian vision prescription because we have here that god is he's the one who is so there's no um sense of who created god um it's similar to asking who baked the baker um he's the one who is he's not created he doesn't have a beginning right um and he's the creator so he's the creator everything else is a creature right and he determined all things right and this gives us a sense of broad perspective that job didn't even have job job asked god to answer him with regards to the things that were happening to him because again he knows that these things can only happen at the lord's hand ultimately speaking he might not be the 
immediate committer of these things with these things ultimately happen at his hand right um and god answered him gave him a very long and scary answer but never answered his question right we live by faith and we don't live knowing everything about what will happen and knowing that everything will work out um in terms of our plans but we know that everything works according to God's plans and that it works together for our good. And that is comfort for the Christian who, of course, will hold on to God in faith. The last thing I'll talk about is, um, okay, two, two more things to talk about. Um, God is Trinity and we should always think in Trinitarian terms. Um, the Trinity is what we call our doctrine of God and how he is, Right as opposed to other things. So there is one God. And we have scriptures, we have numerous scriptures for each of these points, but there are three points that make up the Trinity. The first point is that there is one God. The second point is that um, there are three individuals that are each properly called and worshipped as God. And the last point is that each of these individuals are distinct from each other, right? So there is one God, Yahweh. I'll give you one verse. Deuteronomy chapter 6 verse 4 says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God. The Lord is one. All right? You go on to the next point. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are each properly called and worshipped as God. Romans chapter 1 verse 7, to all who are beloved of God in Rome, called as saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So God is, the Father is worshipped and called as God, right? Um, John chapter 20 verse 28 and 29, Thomas answered and said to him, my Lord and my God, Jesus, so this is who he was talking to, Jesus, Jesus said to him, because you have seen me, have you believed? Blessed are they who did not see me and yet believed. And this is after Jesus has resurrected, right? You need to ask yourself if God would resurrect a blasphemer. If a blasphemer can die and resurrect over the weekend, if that can happen to a blasphemer, you need to ask yourself that, right? Um... And you need to ask yourself, why did Jesus not tell Thomas, hey, what are you talking, don't talk to me like that. Yo, I not on that. Why didn't he tell Thomas that? He told him, blessed are those who did not see and yet believe. And that's you and me, right? Um, but Thomas called him my Lord and my God, and he was not corrected. Jesus is properly called and worshipped as God. Acts chapter 5 verses 3 and 4. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep back some of the price of the land? While it remained unsold, did it not remain your own? And after it was sold, was it not under your control? Why is it that you have conceived this deed in your heart? You have not lied to men, but to God. This is again in the early church. Peter is still around and all of this stuff. And uh, Ananias and Sapphira, they are husband and wife, and they have property that they sold, and they brought some of the proceeds from the property to the church, but they lied and said that they brought all. This is not saying that they necessarily have to bring all, but don't lie about it, right? Don't lie to make people feel like you're bringing more than you're bringing, right? And don't lie to the Holy Spirit, because when, you, when you're doing these things and you're dealing with the church and all of these things, it's the Holy Spirit you're lying to. Right? And Peter says, why are you lying to the Holy Spirit? In verse 3, at the end of verse 4, he says, you have not lied to men, but to God. So the Holy Spirit is properly called and worshipped as God. <clears throat> so that's the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And there are verses for each of these. Right? It's just one verse, one verse, one verse I'm doing here. The last thing should be that the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are distinct from each other. Right? And we see this best in the baptism of jesus matthew chapter 3 verse 16 and 17 after being baptized jesus came up immediately from the water and behold the heavens were opened and he saw the spirit of god descending as a dove and lighting on him and behold a voice out of the heavens said this is my beloved son in whom i am well pleased so we have jesus the son coming out of the water we have the holy spirit descending on Jesus and then after the Holy Spirit has descended on Jesus we have God the Father speaking from heaven and 
speaking approvingly of Jesus. So we have, unless God is a deceiver, right? We have already established when we talk about how we know what we know, that God is the ground of knowledge. And being the ground of knowledge, he's the ground of truth, right? He, he, without God, there's no truth, right? How do you get truth without God? So God is not deceiving us here, right? He's not putting out, putting, putting together a play for us here. This is what happens. We have all the members of the Trinity doing different things in different places here right so they're distinct but we know from other verses that they are each properly called god and we know from other verses that there is one god so this is how we get our trinity right and uh, how this would help us in our worldview is it does not um let us cut disconnect the god of the old testament from the god of the new testament a lot of people speak as though the God from the New Testament is nicer, even though I just read to you guys a passage in which someone died in the New Testament for lying about how much money they were bringing, right? Um, let's put that aside. There are other passages about people dying from um, not discerning the body rightly and, and eating communion in a, in a debaucherous way. People dying and getting sick from that. All of that is in the New Testament. Um there's um yeah so is is the same god one two when um sodom and gomorrah was burning up in the old testament jesus was present jesus was active jesus was in agreement the pre-incarnate christ he was there right we have to think in trinitarian terms we can't put these god these 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 um gods apart from each other they're, they're not gods it's one god Yahweh is our God. Yahweh is one. We have one God. All right? So this is the Trinity in a nutshell or three. Right? So um, the last thing I just want to quickly mention is God being holy. All right? And this is an important thing that I don't think is emphasized as much as God being love. Right? But um, the Bible never says love, love, love. But in Isaiah chapter 6 verse 3, it says holy, 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 right? And one called out to another and said, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. So God is holy, 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 all right? And God's holiness has to do with his righteousness and it has to do with his being set apart, him being like, nobody else all right so god is holy um god is not love as opposed to all of his other attributes that's that's not um what god is god is not divorced from any of his attributes right he is he is not um he's not just this he's not just that or whatever the case is but the attributes that is um, emphasized the most and that influences a lot of what happens in the scriptures is God's holiness, right? And what happens right after this, after coming in contact with God's holiness, this is what happens to Isaiah. This is not in my notes. I'm pulling it up, up on my phone now. Verse 5 of Isaiah chapter 6. Then I said, woe is me, for I am ruined because I am a man of unclean lips and I live at, among a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the king, the Lord of hosts so isaiah saw god and he saw god as holy and what that did was that that exposed his sin to him you understand that in god's presence he was aware of his sin all right and the only way to deal with that sin is not to make an excuse from it is not to have an explanation for guilt that put sin aside is not anything else but to turn from your sin and to trust in jesus christ jesus christ he is the only one who can save you from your sin right and he does it well he is a good savior and he saves completely all right so um that will be the end of our episode today but not the end of our comp on on our conversation 
of the Christian vision prescription. We're going to be putting together our presuppositions more and more um, over, I guess, a bunch of episodes because I have a lot of stuff that I put together um, for this, but it cannot all go into one episode. That would be um, sadism on my part, and I won't do that to you guys, you lovely listeners. So all I have to say to you at this point in time is um, get yourself something nice. Um, buy me a doubles, the support links there in the, in, in the show notes, wherever that is, right? And uh, of course, as always, praise Jesus. You made it through the whole episode, the show done. Hope you get some positive in the nucleus, you know, a proton. Anyhow, you know the slogan. Praise Jesus.